Uh, real, real quick, let me ask this. Uh, how many of you can just, uh, by, by noise, maybe by, by uh, applause, how many of you can just say that you do have something in your life to praise God for? Do you have anything like that? Good. I'm glad you're able to respond that way because that's kind of where we're heading this morning. Uh, we're in this series. We call it Who Cares, okay? And uh, maybe you've asked that question this last week. Maybe you've la- asked that question over the past year or so. Uh, times in your life where you're just going, well, who really cares for me and what's going on in my life? In particular today, we're talking about who cares about my health? Who cares about my health? With, with that being said, we're going to find out who does care about your health. I want you to grab your Bibles. I want you to grab some notes that maybe were passed to you when you came in. Get your pen. Get ready to write a few things down this morning. It is my intention to let you out of here a bit early today. As some of you are coming in this morning, you notice something taking place here from the last service. Uh, we're going to say that same thing is going to take place at the end of this service. So that's why I want to let you out a little bit early for those to respond as they feel led to respond regarding health regarding healing and what God says about healing here in his word in scripture in the Bible okay let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer father we thank you so much that uh, that you are the God who does care and you care about our health you care about our bodies you care about our whole person thank you that you are that kind of God a God not far removed from us Father, this, this morning we ask that you will, uh, by your spirit, begin to speak to us and move through us. Uh, Father, we ask that you will be able to call praise out of us so that you are glorified and you are honored above all levels. Father, we ask this morning that you will touch those who need to be touched by you today. And as a result, we can rejoice. Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, real quick, uh, let me just ask this question. How many of you, uh, by show of hands, would say that either you or somebody that you know is, has, has a very serious illness in their life right now, okay? Yeah, just look around. That's what I thought. Most of you, if not all of you, uh, at least you know somebody, if it's not you, who has a serious illness. Uh, well, knowing this and seeing this, we, we have to go, what does God say about this? Is church the place to talk about this, or do we just leave that in the hospital or there in the doctor's office? Is that something we should discuss? I mean, we've got to ask the question, who cares? Who cares? And the real question is, God, do you care? Do you care about... Me physically, do you care about my health? Do you care about what's going on in my life? And maybe you've asked that question uh, before directly to God. God, do you even care? Do you care about my health? Maybe you're asking that right now. I know in, in this group of people here today, there are people from all walks of life. There are people who have different stories, different backgrounds, people going through a lot of different things. I believe that even in this room, there are some who would say, you know what, I'm, I'm really kind of a cynic with all of this stuff. Um, I, I don't know maybe where I stand so much. I'm even wondering if there is such a God, and if there is a God, if that God would even care about me here on this earth, if that God did exist, exist if he would care even about me physically. Is that the type of God that there is? And, maybe, and I just want to say that's okay. It's okay for you to think that way. It's okay for you to be here thinking that way. Because what we find is this whole story that I'm about to present to you, it's a bunch of people coming around Jesus going, all right, come on now. I don't know if this stuff is for real. I don't know if this stuff is true. Uh, and, and it could very well be for you that today you just kind of put it out there to God and say, show me something. Show me something. Uh, Maybe, maybe, God, you can prove yourself because I'm one looking, I'm one searching, I'm one, I'm, I have that mind where I just want to know. And that's okay. In fact, it's great that you're there today because I believe that God does answer, God does respond, and that God does move. And it's very likely that he will begin to show himself to you in such a way. Now, I want to go to the story. I want to go to the book of Luke. And the reason I think it's so cool that we're going to Luke here today is because Luke himself was a doctor. Luke himself was a physician, and he, he, he puts together this account of what happened here in the life of Jesus. And we begin in Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 17. It says, One day, while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. 
And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, and just back up real quick and emphasize something, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. It's interesting, I think, that he starts there. He starts with the sin. He starts with forgiving that sin. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, Why does, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So, I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. A little bit ago, I asked, do you have any reason to praise God? And, 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 and so many of you in here were like, yeah, I've got something in my life to praise God for. And I believe that today is an opportunity for you, for me, for all of us to see some amazing things. The reason we can see some amazing things is because we have an amazing God. But where are you at today? What's going on with you? Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. Have you ever had a day where um, things didn't go as, uh, as you had planned? Anybody? Yeah? Probably all of us, right? Um, yesterday was one of those days for me, Okay. Yesterday was one of those days for me. Things didn't go as I had planned. Uh, I had in my mind what was going to happen and what should happen and the way the day should go, and uh, things just didn't quite go that way. You see, uh, yesterday evening, uh, both of my, both of my uh, teenage children, they, uh, they, uh, they prepared themselves, they met up with their dates for the night, and they both headed off to the prom and, uh, in separate cars. And so as soon as they leave, it was kind of like, they're gone. This is kind of cool. Kim and I, we got a night to ourselves, man. It's going to be fun. And then suddenly the phone rang. The phone rang, and it was my son, and, and, and he was telling my wife that he had gotten on the highway on the way to the prom with his date, and suddenly his car just quit working, and he stranded on the side of I-75. And, and Kim tells me, I, I get in my truck, I take off to go and, and, and see if I can help, see if I can rescue him. And I, I pull in, I find him right off of, of Hudson Bridge. Uh, uh, Hudson Bridge, we got off of Hudson, on the Hudson Bridge and we kind of went to the side, and all the way in the far left lane. And there he was, he was sitting there in, in, in his Jeep with his date. And I pull up behind, and uh, man, you know, it's just traffic and traffic and traffic and traffic on I-75. How many of you knew yesterday's traffic on I-75 was because of me? Anybody? No? No? Okay. Well, there's trap, and, and so I pull in behind him. He gets out, and uh, I say, "Man, uh, what's going on? What's wrong?" And uh, he'd been talking with Kim, and uh, and I get on the phone with Kim, and Kim says, "Well, according to the sound, uh, the clutch went out." I was like, "She knows. I don't know. Okay, she knows." And uh, I said, oh, man, clutch went out. Okay, uh, there's nothing we can do. I, I got Chase and his date, gave him the car. He hopped in. They took off, went to the prom. And there I am on I-75. <laughs> Stuck. And so uh, I, uh, I called Kim back, and she said, anything I can do? I said, yeah, you can try to call a tow truck um, since it is the clutch and, uh, and uh, see if you can... Uh, Get a truck truck. She called 10 different tow truck companies 
10 different ones. And, and, and finally, the last one said, yeah, we can send somebody and we can get you some help. So I sat down and I began to wait. And as I sat there and I waited, um, my attitude started uh, <laughs> not getting so good. Uh, have, any of you ever have a little kind of pity party? You ever do that? You ever go there? Yeah? You kind of do a little bit of complaining, you know? And that's what I'm doing. I'm just like, oh, man, seriously, why me? Why me tonight? Tonight of all nights. I, I, I've got to get up and I've got to preach to people in the morning. I shouldn't be stranded here. Why me? You ever do that type of stuff, huh? Yeah. And I'm sitting there. I'm going, why this car? I mean, that car's fine. <laughs> that car's fine. That car's fine. That one, too. And, and as I'm sitting there, I, I, even, I, I look at people passing by, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing church members. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, hey, hey and hey. <laughs> and, and, there's a, and, and I'm telling you, some of you, you saw me, and you pretended not to, okay? <laughs> I saw you. I'm sitting there, and my attitude's not good. And, and uh, finally, finally, one, one church member, uh, he did show up, and, and he comes up, and he says, oh, hey, Pastor Bo, I thought that was you over here on the side of the road. And uh, uh, he goes, how is everything? I says, the clutch, I'm waiting for a tow truck. He's like, all right, see you later. And, <laughs> and then, believe it or not, I actually ended up, I got a text, and it was Pastor Neil texting me saying, was that I just saw you I just saw on the side of the I-75? Yeah, and, um, it's my attitude is bad, you know, and I'm just kind of upset and I'm kind of angry. But then um, I, I believe an invasion took place. And what I mean by uh, it, an invasion of my thoughts, you know, because it couldn't have come from me. It couldn't have come from me. It was, it was, it was, uh, maybe you've had this before, but as I'm sitting there and I'm pouting and I'm upset and I'm angry, this one thought comes in and it, it hits me and, and it was the thought of, well, at least it wasn't an accident. Um, at least it wasn't on the north side of town where they were heading. At least you still have your son. At least you, at least you have a car. At least you, and they started coming at me. This invasion of thoughts. And, and it, it went from pity party to a time of prayer and praising God on the side of I-75. Don't get me wrong, I was still praying. I wish this tow truck would hurry up and get here, you know. <laughs> but for the hour and whatever amount of minutes I sat there, there was a shift. There was a, you know what, Th this might be an inconvenience, this might be a pain, this might be a problem, but even through this I can praise. Even through this I can praise. Do you, do you have anything in your life that perhaps is there, that, that the temptation is there uh, to, to be upset. And you might even say, I have every right to be upset. I mean, look at this problem I've got. Look at this, look at this pain in my life. But instead, but instead, something begins to happen. Are you, are, do you have anything like that that perhaps through that you can still begin to pray and praise God for because that, that, that really is the challenge for you today, for us today, for me and you today, for, for where we are. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some more talking up here, but as I'm just rambling on, okay, um, I want you to intentionally begin right now to pray and praise God through that, through that. Because that, that really is what all this is about. You get to the end of the story, and this dude's jumping around praising God. The people there are praising God. 
And you see the picture of what is to happen and what is to take place. I'm going I'm to point out what I call some amazing things that we can see even from the story in here today. But I want you to kind of understand where I believe it is that we are at. And, and when I say where it is that we are at, where, where it is that we are at in, this, uh, in the history of the world, okay? Now, what I mean by that is as we go through God's word right here, we see Jesus. And, and Luke says, and throughout all the gospels, Matthew and Mark and John, uh, you see them say, Jesus said this. Jesus preached this. Jesus would preach, his message would be, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has come. It's arrived. The kingdom of God is right, right here with you. And then it says he would go and he would start to heal people. And that was evidence that the kingdom of God had come. And then after that, after he would heal people, he then passes it on to his disciples, and not just his 12, but 72 others. He says, get out there and start healing people. Get out there and start praying for people. And you'll see all these things begin to take place and happen. And that's just evidence that the kingdom of God is here, that it's come. He's ushered in the kingdom of God. And these people would hear this and know what that meant. But then uh, we get to Paul, the Apostle Paul. And Paul goes on to say that, that uh, you know what, we're, we're heading in that direction and, and it's here and it's arrived and we see this stuff happening. But even through all this, it's as if all creation and, and, and our bodies, it's, we groan for the day when he will finally arrive. The day he finally arrives, the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's described in Revelation. Some of you will go on to read Revelation. You'll see where uh, Jesus ushers in this time or this place where there will finally be no more crying, no more tears, and no more pain whatsoever. And we look forward to that day. What is that? What does that all that all that mean? I believe we're in a season, a, a changing season. Yes, the kingdom of God has come. Jesus has shifted everything through his shed blood on the cross and the forgiveness of sins. And the healing begins to take place in us and in this world. And we know that there are some people you pray and they're healed. We know there are other people you pray and they're not healed. What's going on? It's a changing season as we move towards that day, that final day when Jesus comes. and we, There's no more crying. There is no more pain anymore. You understand what a changing season is, right? If you live in Atlanta or have lived in Atlanta for any time whatsoever, you understand this changing season, right? I mean, here in Atlanta, it can, it can be burning hot one day, and then suddenly it rains and it's freezing cold the next, Right? Or here in Atlanta in this changing season we're in right now, uh, one day you go outside and there's this yellow plague covering everything, right? <laughs> and if you've been here for any time at all, you know that's not to last. Maybe a week from now we're not even going to think about it anymore because it will, it will have passed. It will be gone. And the same with us. We see this changing season where God is moving and he moves here and he moves here. And all these different things are taking place. But we're moving towards that one day, that one day where everything will be made whole. There is no more crying, tears, pain, sorrow anymore. And that's where we're heading. But right here, right now, are you able to praise God? to take things to him and then to praise him through whatever it is that you are facing. Because if you are, I'm telling you, you're going to see some amazing things take place. Here are some amazing things I want you to write down. The first one is simply this. Number one, it's amazing to realize, and we've seen these in this story already. Number one, it's amazing to realize that God does care about my physical health as well as my spiritual health. God does care about my physical health as well as my spiritual health. How many, how many of you have ever experienced somebody who is very, very sick and the doctors give up and then somebody says, well, all we can do now is pray? You ever hear that? Isn't that kind of weird? Where it, prayer becomes our last resort? Well, all we can do now is pray, you know? Oh, that's all we got. And, and, and maybe that should shift a bit. You see, for so long, what we've done is we've taken that which is physical and, and, and separated from that which is spiritual. 
and we go, if I want spiritual, and if I want, I want to be healthy spiritually, maybe I'll go to church, maybe I'll go to Sunday school, maybe I'll get a devotional book, and that's all over here. But if I want to be healthy physically, then I've got to go to this doctor, I've got to go to this doctor and this doctor. And that's good to go to these doctors, and God gives healing through a lot of different doctors. But I don't think they should be so separated. Why? God wants to heal the whole person. He's concerned with the whole body. You notice what took place in this story, right? The first thing Jesus does is he says, hey, for your, your, your sins, I, I, you're forgiven. And we go, that's a spiritual thing right there. Your sins, they're forgiven. And then suddenly he moves on to, and by the way, you're paralyzed, now walk. Spiritual as well as that which is physical. But I believe they're very related. And not only do I believe that, that's what science is starting to find out as well. That's what doctors are starting to realize as well. There's one doctor who went on to say that 90, he believes 90% of his patients that come and see him could walk out totally healthy if they could handle or deal with the guilt in their lives. It's spiritual related to that which is physical. Let me read an article to you. I just uh, I pulled this one up. I thought it was very interesting. It says, um, as Dr. Dale Matthews examines... The elderly woman sitting in front of him, he notes that her blood pressure is high and she is complaining of a sinus infection. Rather than simply prescribing more medicines, Matthews chooses a method of treatment that many of his colleagues would consider radical. He prays. The patient's blood pressure immediately drops 20 points. Her sinus is clear. She starts breathing freely. She begins praising God in the doctor's office. I have the Lord on my side, she says to an observer. I praise him every day, and I love my doctor. Matthews then encourages the woman to keep taking her medicine and writes out several prescriptions. Then, after examining her leg bruised in a fall, he talks with her for several more minutes, supporting her decision to join the church choir. The best thing you can do for your health, he says, is to keep praising God every day. On yet another prescription pad, the doctor writes out Colossians 3.17 and hands it to the woman. He hugs her and the woman beams. God bless you, doctor, she says. God bless you, Juanita, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Matthews answers. Matthews, an internist and associate professor of medicine at the Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, D.C., is one of the growing number of medical professionals who are discovering the medical benefits of faith and prayer. For centuries, families and individuals facing medical crisis have made prayer the bedrock of their experience. What is new is that certain segments in the medical community are beginning scientifically to study the effects of prayer on illnesses, illnesses and injuries. And they are discovering that there is a growing body of evidence that suggests prayer can be an effective tool for combating illnesses. Uh, do you see what's going on here? It's suddenly the scientific community is catching up with something that has been written down for so long that there is power in prayer. There is power in prayer. And when we take these things to the Lord, not as an afterthought, not as a last chance, but, but every chance we get to take what it is that we are going through and say, here, Lord, I'm bringing this before you. I'm taking this to you. Then what we do is, is give God the opportunity to move in a way that will glorify and honor and please him. There's something else I want you to write down. Number two, write this. And you, you saw this in this story, okay? Another amazing thing, and it's, it's just neat to think that God really does care that I develop healthy friendships. God cares that I develop healthy friendships. I thought it was so cool. I mean, you read this story, and here are, are these, these friends who, who have a, 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 their sick friend, their, their paralyzed friend, and they want whatever they, they've got to get them to see Jesus. They've got to get them to Jesus. And so they try to figure out how to get him in to see Jesus. There's a crowd and so instead, they can't get through the crowd. They go onto the roof, and they go so far as to cut a hole in some other dude's roof and drop him down through there, 
right in front of Jesus so that they can get him to Jesus. Let me ask, do you have any friends like that? Do you have any friends that would go so far as to do something like that? Do you, do you have friends that they know what's going on in your life, they know the needs you have in their life, and they're going to do whatever they can to get you to Jesus? I mean, I read this story, and I'm going, That's a, those are real friends right there. Those are the type of people who would stop when you're stuck on the side of the road and help you out, man. Do you, do you have friends like that? Or, or let me ask this question, are you a friend like that? Are you a friend like that, that that, that person that you know has a, has a serious illness, your friend, they, they, they know that you are the type of person that each and every day you are, you're taking their illness and them to Jesus in prayer. Do they, do they know you're that type of friend? Uh, we, we live in this world, man. It's, it's one of these things where I, it seems like we keep segmenting ourselves off from everybody else. And uh, we have all this technology to communicate and to make new friends. But it seems like the more technology we have to communicate and make new friends, the more we cut ourselves from having actual friends. And, and what's kind of weird is, I mean, we can have a crowd like this of people coming in. And in this crowd of people, there are people scattered throughout who, who are going, I just feel so lonely. I just feel so lonely. I just don't know if I have a single friend, true friend, real friend. God is concerned about your relationships. God wants you to have a real friend. God wants you to have friends who are taking you to Jesus in prayer. So with that being said, um, here's the deal. Uh, people get nervous when I do this, okay? Um, some people say, ah, it's not my thing. I don't like to do this. Uh, but but I, well, here's the thing. I found that after it's over, everybody's like, that was the coolest thing ever, okay? It's a great thing. It's a good thing. What's going to happen? I'm going to go one, two, three, and on three, you're going to get up. You're going to find somebody in this room you do not know, okay? And you're going to sit down with them, and you're going to say, is there anything that I can pray for you about this next week. Anything in your life that I can, I can take before God this next week. And, and, and then uh, uh, you're going to say to them, is there anything? And they're going to say to you, is there anything I can take? You guys are going to share that in here today, okay? All right? And uh, trust me, you're going to love it, okay? I know it's out of comfort zones, but uh, you'll get over it, all right? <laughs> One, two, three, go. Right. Real quick, let me ask, how many of you uh, how many of you just met a new friend? Did you, uh, cool. How many of you how many of you met somebody who just kind of creeped you out? I mean not <laughs> don't ask don't answer that. Cool. How many of you that's not that how, did you enjoy that? It's not that bad, is it? No. It's okay. In fact, I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's something the church has to do more and more of. How cool is it to know that that somebody this whole next week is is committed to lifting you up to God. That's a cool thought, isn't it? Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. God cares that I develop healthy friendships. Number three, God always responds to requests for healings. And I know that sounds weird, okay? But, but he does. It's just he responds in ways that, that we might not always like. I'm going to give you his responses. It's kind of funny because I think sometimes we have this idea of how God operates and how God functions, and it's completely inaccurate. It's completely not in God's Word. It's completely not in God's Bible. Uh, in fact, let me, let me ask this. How many of you ever get one of those emails? It's what I call email guilt, where uh, it says in the email, you have read this email and you will be blessed if you pass it on to 12 other people, right? But if you don't, you don't love Jesus and you're not a true American. Or something like that, right? And he's like, oh, man, I hate I, I wish I hadn't read that because I don't want to pass it on. But I love Jesus. I want to be an American. And so you, you get that, you know? And some of us were like, does God really operate that way? He's like checking my email to see if I, no. No, we look to God's word and how does God respond and how does God act? And it's all throughout his word we're able to see it's already happened. It's already taken place. The first way, write this down, that God might respond 
is I don't hear you. I, I don't hear you. Or maybe a better way of putting it is I, I won't hear you. You see, we find, you find, we, we, we find in, in, in Psalms, we find in Isaiah, we find in 1 Peter, where it says, you know what, I, you're asking me this, but I'm not listening. The reason I'm not listening is because I've told you already about the sin in your life, and I want you to confess that before me so that we can have that relation, that communion, but it's the sin that's messing up our relationship. In fact, it goes so far as to say in, in 1 Peter, Husbands, the way you treat your wife, if you don't treat her well, don't think that I'm going to listen to you. Don't think, don't think, don't think I'm, going to, I'm going to listen and respond to you if you're going to treat one of my daughters in the way that you're treating her. And so we have to ask ourselves, is there something in my life, there's sin in my life that keeps God from listening or hearing me? The, the second way he responds is yes. Sometimes God says yes. How many of you like to hear yes? You like that? That's always the best, right? Yes, God said yes, and sometimes God does say yes. I mean, we just saw right here, these guys come, and Jesus says, yes, get up, walk, and that's a great answer. It's a great answer, but then number three, sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says no. I know some people will preach that the only time that God ever says no is if you're not spiritual enough, or if you don't have enough faith. That's not what we find in God's word. Even the apostle Paul had something that he prayed about for years and years. He called it his thorn in his flesh. And he prayed about it, and God said, no, 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 Paul. And that song we sang earlier, he, it, that was his response to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. All right? When God says no, are you able to praise anywhere? Are you able to say, your grace is still enough for me? Your grace is enough. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait. The timing's not right. Not yet, not yet. His best friends, Lazarus, Martha, Mary, Lazarus is sick. He's about to die, and they're like, man, hurry up and get here, and Jesus just kind of hangs out. He's in no rush. When he finally does get there, Lazarus has already died, and one of, one of the girls comes up and says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. What took you so long? But you see, it was still for God's honor and still for God's glory. And it wasn't about healing him from that sickness. It was about raising him from the dead. Sometimes God says, wait. What's he saying to you? What's he saying to you right now? And whatever it is he's saying to you, or you say, you know what? I still praise you. I still praise you. The last thing I want you to write down is simply this. Number four, my sickness can be used for God's purpose and glory. My sickness, my illness, my struggle can be used for God's purpose and for God's glory. And whatever he does, if he causes me to walk like this man here, I'm going to praise him. If he tells me no, I'm going to praise him. It can be for his glory. One of the, one of, one of the men, a man who just in, has influenced me, for maybe the last 20 years in such a huge way, found out last Friday that his son, 29 years old, who had been suffering from mental illness for, for, for that long, and they prayed, over, they prayed and prayed and prayed that he would be healed. They took him to the best doctors that they could find, and he got the answer, no. Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, wrote the Purpose Driven Life book that many of you have read, the son committed suicide. And now Rick is saying, even through this, even through this, God can use it. God has purpose. God can find glory. This last Friday, um, we took off to Alabama, and I'm not going to tell any Alabama jokes here, okay? Don't worry. Um, but we took off to Alabama to go see my daughter play a soccer game, and uh, Kim and I walk up to the field, and uh, the game's already started, and there's a line of parents there from the opposing team, and they all have these chairs. We didn't have chairs, so we just kind of stood behind them. And as we're standing behind them, um, I noticed there's this lady uh, and sitting in a chair just uh, maybe several yards in front of us, 
And, uh, and she turns around and looks at us and goes, oh, I'm sorry, I thought y'all were somebody else. We're like, oh, no, no problem. And uh, she turns back around, but, but I notice peeking from over her shoulder is a little girl who's sitting on her lap, her, her daughter. And as I look at her daughter, I can see that she, um, there's something wrong with her. There's something not normal. There's something, there's something as I'm looking at, it, it just kind of hits me that I, I, don't, I don't know what it'd be like to have a daughter like that. And I wonder that here's a mom and, and having a daughter in her condition, uh, I wonder if when she, was, when she was born, her parents were like, oh, why us? I wonder if that went through their minds. I wonder if her mom would say, uh, it's just a, such a struggle what I had, what, in raising her in this condition and how she is. And, and it just, these thoughts are going through my mind as this little girl sits there and she's kind of peering over the shoulder at me. And, and, and I just kind of wave to her and, and the little girl smiles back. And the next thing, next thing you know, the girl hops out of her mom's lap. And she starts walking over towards me like this. And I'm like... And then her mom uh, sees what she's doing, and she just yells to me, all she wants to do is give you a hug. And I'm like, oh, okay. And she comes, and she gives me the biggest, warmest hug. Just so sweet. Just holds on to me. And so I'm, I'm there hugging her. I'm saying, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your hug. And then she, she lets go of me, and she grabs my, my wife's hand. And now she wants to take my wife to meet everybody there. <laughs> just trying to drag her around. And I'm watching all this happen, all this take place, and I see the mom, and her mom's over there just beaming. Just is this look of great pride in this girl. And it, it just, it just kind of hit me how something that we in this world would look at and go, that's, that's, a, that's a mistake. It's a problem. It's a condition. It's an ailment. It's a disorder. God says, that's the most beautiful thing on the field. He gives us beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. A garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. And that's what he wants to give you today. The ability to praise him no matter what. Will you praise him today? Father, we thank you so much for the love that you've given to us. You know the conditions. You know what's going on in this place. We would ask for healing. And at the same time, we praise you through it. We love you. Praise you. In Jesus' name we pray.